suit against you to evict you. To evict me, right. Okay. So when they filed this suit to evict me, um, I always say, when you're in court, what brings up jurisdiction is subject matter jurisdiction, which is a thing, and personal jurisdiction, which is a person, an injury, whatever, okay? And it, but it has to, these two things have to exist in order to have jurisdiction. You must have a plaintiff and a defendant, two opposing people with two different opposing interests to have a dispute. Somebody's been damaged, somebody did the damage. That's right. Right. Per the online electric law library, standing is the legal right to initiate a lawsuit. To do so, a person must be sufficiently affected by the matter at hand, and there must be a case or controversy that can be resolved by legal action. Importantly, there are three requirements for Article III standing for a valid lawsuit. Article III courts are federal courts, established by or under Article III of the U.S. Constitution, which states, quote, the judicial power of the United States shall be vested in one Supreme Court and in such inferior courts as the Congress may from time to time ordain and establish. Unquote. The three requirements for standing are, number one, a particular and real injury in fact that creates a legal interest in the outcome of a matter. Number two, a direct causal relationship between the injury and the challenged conduct in that the action of the accused person can be traced as the cause of the injury. And, number three, there is a more than speculative likelihood that the redress of the causes of the claimed injury by competent court rulings will provide relief to the injured party for each cause of court action. It is up to the complainant in each case to prove to the court that their case meets each of these qualifications in order to prove a legitimate standing for taking someone to court. Thus, courts determine allegations of fact based upon evidence and sworn declarations and affidavits of the complaining party. If those declared allegations and affidavits that swear to the authentication of material facts are determined to be fraudulent, the complaint not only loses standing to be in court, the complainant is, by such a determination, guilty of numerous felony crimes. This is precisely what Crystal Price is saying now after providing ample proof to corrupted state and federal courts operating here in Michigan that her home was taken by a conspiracy of racketeers consisting of the Trot and Trot Foreclosure Law Firm, the Wayne County Sheriff's Department, and the Wayne County Register of Deeds, along with the criminal aiding and abetting of the 34th District Court Judge Brian Oakley located in Romulus, also in Wayne County, Michigan and additional aiding and abetting by one federal magistrate and one regular judge of the U.S. District Court for the Eastern District of Michigan, both located in Detroit, and by additionally two former Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals chief judges and a third Sixth Circuit judge who were all aiding and abetting in this felony racketeering and conspiracy to deprive Crystal Price of her property and other rights. Crystal can prove that she's gotten all of this out in the open as a matter of public record, decrying what the only system available to her for proper redress is doing to her criminally, rather than to help her to resolve and to rectify what Trot and Trot, Bank of America, the government-sponsored enterprise of Freddie Mac, and the lower courts are all doing to her. It is important to note that while the government system in place, being both the judicial and the executive branches of due process, and law enforcement has failed for discriminatory and other racketeering reasons linked to interstate commerce. So too has the mainstream media failed to identify and report this broad-based scope of corporate and government corruption. That is why we the people understand that it is up to us to do our own policing, our own investigating, and our own reporting as RICO busters. We recognize that to take our country back requires all of us to get involved by reeling back in lawyers and government usurpation and stealing, by fraud, and by fighting hard against the further usurpation and stealing of our rights, our money, our property, and our will for the future of the people of this nation. Welcome back to the seventh in a series of RICO Busters. 
They who can give up essential liberty to obtain a little temporary safety deserve neither liberty nor safety. Check it out. NationalLibertyAlliance.org We're Rico Busters. And we're back. <laughs> and we're with Crystal Price. And she is uh, explaining some of the, uh, the things that have happened to her as a victim of uh, government crimes, victim of foreclosure fraud, the victim of Trot and Trot Law Firm, operating in uh, Farmington, Michigan. Mm -hmm. And across the state. Right. <laughs> so now they have the deputy sheriff in and for the Wayne County, Michigan, whose address is 1231 St. Is that Antoine? Antoine. Antoine Street, Detroit, Michigan. So I went further to investigate because I'm trying to figure out where this Felicia Mack is. She said he's a he, she, so I want to go find her. So I go to this address. And I'm driving around, driving around, and I'm like, I said, I know this can't be the address. The Greek Town Ho Casino Hotel, this can't. Sure enough, the address of 1200 St. Antoine is the Greek Casino Hotel uh, that she's using as the address of her place of employment. Now, this says 1231. And this is 1200. 1200 okay so next door across the street no try a stop sign or something or on the curb or something because 1200 and 1231 is the same address hmm okay there, there's no address that is 1231 it's tw the 1231 is 1200 okay it used to be this before the Greek town casino hotel but it's not no more because they done tore it out okay now this is 2012 11 now how long has that casino been down there the hotel Few years, a lot more than few years. I think at least ten. Okay. Okay. All right. <laughs> okay. Now you went inside too. Yeah, to I went inside and got this woman the the supervisor's card mm -hmm. to prove that that address is not the address that she works at. It. Okay. Then on here, my parcel number does not match my true partial number so I went to the city of Romulus and got my it says that the number they have is not a valid number so so trot and trot I mean in this fraudulent document that has Felicia Mack being a he right mm -hmm. is this one? okay yep. and a uh, put this this against um, uh, uh, Pr Freddie Prince Freddie, Freddie Prince, yeah. Okay. And Trot and Trot also, besides going after Freddie Prince on uh, Prince's house, but they're actually taking your house, mm -hmm. um, they are putting down the wrong parcel number. Mm -hmm. This this number is not the correct that, number of your property. That's right. In the, in the where is that, the, the Lieber Code or the... the, the yes, the, this, this uh, in the... Um, it's in the register of deeds. Deeds, office. right, okay, right. So well, according my my par correct parcel number is down in the assessor's office. That's my correct number. Okay. But the numbers that they have in the register of deeds office are not the correct numbers. Okay. So the sheriff has has constituted a sheriff's deed that's fraudulent itself. Mm -hmm. This comes out of the fr sheriff's department. That's right. This is not trot and trot now. Th that's right. This is the sheriff's department in getting involved in this racketeering that's scheme right. to to take your home, and and it's the proof of this. Being being racketeering, at, or at least part of it, because mm -hmm. we got a lot of it, mm -hmm. is the, a fraudulent parcel number. Mm -hmm. So your parcel number is a different number. So they can actually one day say, well, we didn't, you know, paper-wise, we didn't mm -hmm. see this is a different number, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but you're still without a house. Before going further, we should take a closer look at this fraudulent sheriff's deed and see beyond the surface features of a misspelled name, a parcel number that is one digit off, the fact that it reflects a sale by a special deputy sheriff who by all accounts was never actually sworn to be a special deputy and who purportedly is a he and not a she, and the fact that the deed lists the employment of the special sheriff's deputy as being at a non-existent location. We have already noted that these surface features alone are individually, as well as altogether, sufficient to clearly invalidate this racketeering instrument. We already know from previous Rico Busters segments what transpired prior to the execution of this fraudulent sheriff deed on July 27, 2011. 
We have presented the evidence of the drafting of fraudulent foreclosure notices by the Trot and Trot law firm stating that Crystal Price was in default on her mortgage, when in fact Ms. Price was being dual-tracked by Trot and Trot on behalf of their supposed clients at BAC Home Loans LP, and that the federal government's conditions after the bank bailout precludes and forbids foreclosure on anyone like Crystal who qualified for a loan modification or who was in a loan modification program and making proper payments as Miss Price was when Trot and Trot foreclosed on her anyway using a criminal smorgasbord of deceptive tactics. We have already shown fraudulent advertising by the affiliates of the Trot and Trot law firm as employees of the Detroit Legal News who are robo-signing notary public names on sworn and notarized statements and claim that their foreclosure advertising comported with Michigan laws while using invalid initials of notaries rather than full signatures as otherwise required by Michigan law and the Michigan Secretary of State. Yet this sworn and notarized sheriff's deed, attested to by an imposter sheriff's deputy, Felicia Mack, who was purportedly a he instead of a she and employed at a non-existent location or at the Greek town casino and hotel, justifies its operative existence by fraudulent claim that Crystal Price was in default on the conditions of her mortgage, when she clearly was not. The fact that Felicia Mack conducted this sheriff's sale of Crystal Price's home, which amounted to a conspiracy to grand theft of Ms. Price's property by the Trot and Trot lawyers, the Detroit Legal News employees, the Wayne County Sheriff's Department, and the Wayne County Register of Deeds, is sufficient. For starters, the fact that Ms. Price has evidence that Felicia Mack is neither a he nor a special sheriff deputy is a blatant violation of MCL 51.70, which states, quote, Persons may also be deputized by a sheriff, by an instrument in writing, to do particular acts who shall be known as special deputies. Appointed deputy or deputies, other than special deputies, before entering upon the duties of office, shall execute and file with the county clerk an official bond running to the people of this state in the amount of at least $2,500. The fact is that whether by robo-signing or not, Felicia Mack also signed an affidavit of auctioneer in the same way that she signed the sheriff's deed which was under the same claim that she was acting in the capacity of a deputy sheriff, being subject to filing of an official bond for $2,500, and without a claim of being exempt from such a bond as a special deputy. Therefore, if this man by the name of Felicia Mack was truly a special deputy, this sworn and notarized affidavit failed to disclose this auctioneer's true job title as that of a special deputy. In such case, there still should have been some evidence attached to the sheriff's deed proving Felicia Mack's appointment to a special deputy or special sheriff's deputy rather than an affidavit of auctioneer, which only serves to reiterate that which has not been proven in the first place. In other words, the affidavit of auctioneer does nothing to validate the sheriff's deed since in both instances the signer is the same criminal imposter. Oh, the devil truly is in the details. What all these documents otherwise prove was that the Bank of America and the Trot and Trot Foreclosure Mill as their corporate agent, as previously proven by the multi-billion dollar Mackler Whistleblower False Claims Act settlement, are guilty once again of fraudulently foreclosing in violation of Michigan Compiled Laws 600.32041A, and 600-3205-A and 600-3220 being done criminally by using mere color of law to simulate legal process in a scheme of racketeering that is being employed against many tens of thousands of other homeowners each year. 
that the corrupt state and federal courts aid and abet the continuance of this very organized and widespread operation. What more is interesting about the dastardly deeds behind what went on leading up to this fraudulent sheriff's deed is the question of whether any auction actually took place at all. The fact is that though the public notice reflects the building location where the auction was to take place, this Coleman A. Young Municipal Building has just under 20 floors of office and courtroom space and no room number was referenced by this advertisement or on the sheriff's deed. Is this just another typo? I think not. The room number where the crime took place of stealing Crystal Price's home did not appear until after the fact, in the affidavit of auctioneer. That room number, where the actions of the sheriff from the executive branch of county government allegedly took place, however, were in the judicial courtroom of Daniel P. Ryan. So the question then becomes, whose taxpayer budget was used, or misappropriated, for the use of this judicial courtroom? An even bigger and more significant question is also raised. Here's a sample list of Wayne County mortgage foreclosure sales that was published by the Wayne County Sheriff's Department depicting all of the foreclosed homes purportedly set for auction bidding on September 19, 2013. What we know from the information that we have is that on the calendar, September 19, 2013, fell on a Thursday. We also know from the Sheriff's Department's own public website, foreclosure sales are scheduled to occur each Wednesday and Thursday, but not starting until 1 o'clock in the afternoon. According to the Coleman Young Building Authority, the hours available to the public to be in the building ends at 5.30 p.m. weekdays, which gives only a maximum of four and a half hours to conduct bids and complete documentation for however many homes are scheduled for auction on any particular Wednesday or Thursday afternoon. Yet look at the number of homes that were scheduled for foreclosure sales on this one single Thursday afternoon of September 19, 2013. The list literally covers five full pages numbering 39 homes on each page. That is nearly 200 homes with bid amounts ranging from between the tens of thousands to the several hundreds of thousands of dollars, and with the sheriff collecting a fee of $50 per home on the bidding for this one day alone. Practically speaking, this is impossible to auction off this many homes in just a few hours. Something doesn't make sense here. Moreover, with regard to the sale of Crystal's home on Wednesday, July 27, 2011, per the arguments made by Crystal to both the Federal District Court and to the local District Court and State Circuit Court in 2012 about the courts having no jurisdiction and Freddie Mac having no standing to foreclose upon her in the first place because the only real party of interest on record for the house was Crystal Price herself. Neither BAC Home Loan Servicing LP nor Bank of America N.A. could legally foreclose upon Crystal because of all the fraud perpetrated by Trot and Trot Foreclosure Mill during the foreclosure process, and by the fact that all foreclosure proceedings were against the name of Prince and not Price, and while referencing the wrong parcel number of land being foreclosed upon. Thus, Crystal's reasoning was that there was no way for Freddie Mac to be the purchaser of a home from Bank of America as a mere loan servicer because, by law and Freddie Mac and Fannie Mae's own written policies regarding possession of the original promissory note, the loan servicing bank could not legally foreclose on Crystal's home or any other home because the loan servicing banks are not the real party of interest. They simply do not own the original promissory note. So, they could not have purchased Crystal's home from the bank. And in fact, when requested to provide Crystal with evidence that any such sale took place, such as by a sales receipt on the purchase of the home, the Wayne County Register of Deeds could not produce a thing. The fact is that when Crystal ran a deed check on her last name of Price, 
What the register of deeds records showed is that the principal person foreclosed upon was the principal party of Freddie Prince Jr., the Hollywood movie star, when in fact no actual person by the name of Fred Prince Jr. had ever existed as owner of this property. There's a real party of interest in this case. These two things have to exist in order to have jurisdiction. You must have a plaintiff and a defendant, two opposing people with two different opposing interests to have a dispute. Somebody's been damaged, somebody did the damage. That's right. Right. So when we go into court, these attorneys show up representing Freddie Mac, Fannie Mae, the bank, and everybody else, but see, that's wrong because there's supposed to be a client there, a, a, an attorney cannot um, briefs or oral mar arguments are not facts before the court. That's, that's because the lawyer can't testify. That's right. And you can't question and cross-examine a lawyer. That's right. Just because he's on the other side. That's right. right. And so they've been getting away with this so long, they've been taking, when pro se's go into court and they challenge, well, where's the, where's the injured party? Oh, we don't have to do that. Oh, yes, you are. Because I have a right. See, that's my due process there. You're, you're denying me my rights. I have a right to stand before somebody who says I owe them something. I have a right to cross-examine them. I'm not cross-examining no imaginary person. And I'm tired of talking to Freddie Mac a building because that's exactly what you're talking to, a building. Okay, I want to see a living, live human being in here. After conspiring with Bank of America slash Countrywide, a.k.a. BAC Home Loan Servicing LP, to employ these underhanded means in early 2011, to establish a fraudulent paper trail for taking Ms. Price's home, without otherwise having a legal basis to do so, Trot and Trot suddenly became re-employed by the new so-called owner of the home. Under the fraudulent color of being able to prove that they followed Michigan laws on non-judicial foreclosures using the counterfeit documents they had generated for procedurally taking Crystal's home, David Trot's law firm next filed their case in the 34th District Court in Romulus to have Ms. Price and her family judicially evicted from the house. This is the point at which Ms. Price filed her counterclaim against Freddie Mac and their Trot and Trot attorneys, being outraged by such deception by Trot and Trot thus far, and being determined to have her day in court to reveal the truth of what was being done to her by fraud. As shown by our previous Rico Buster segments, however, Trot Law Firm conspired with the 34th District Court Judge Brian Oakley in what was clearly some type of closed-door ex parte proceeding carried out again under color of law and in felonious fashion to produce two fraudulent orders of the judge and a fraudulent showing that due process hearings had otherwise occurred in compliance with Michigan laws governing summary proceedings, and when in fact no such hearings were documented by either the court's register of actions or the court reporter whose job it is to transcribe the events of those types of hearings. The first fraudulent order issued by the dishonorable Judge Oakley on March 27, 2012, was to direct Crystal Price to pay $700 per month to an escrow account in the joint name of Fannie Mae, despite that it was Freddie Mac that was the new purported owner of Crystal's foreclosed home. Having placed that financial burden upon Crystal, the second fraudulent order issued by Oakley just a week later on April 3, 2012, was to sever Crystal's counter-complaint from the case Freddie Mac had filed against her to have her evicted, thus compounding the cost for Crystal to fight two separate cases rather than one. Does anyone see any other reason for this type of court proceeding to get this complicated, if not for the explicit reason of making it so much more difficult for Crystal to explain what happened to her at each step along the way when escalating her appeals to the next higher level courts, and with each higher court adding further injustices and complicating the matters even further. And with this entire process actually being the reflection of a widespread racketeering operation of the courts, by a conspiracy of abuses by Wayne County judges to force Crystal Price into a never-ending set of successive venues where her due process rights are trampled,
so as to effectively do process her to death. This is felony color of law at its most revealing finest. As shown, the second order severing Crystal's counter complaint was drafted by a second law firm to enter the picture under the name of Dykema, a.k.a. the Dykema Gossett Law Firm, which is referenced in the court's registry of actions as co-counsel for the government-sponsored criminal perpetrator of Freddie Mac. Notably, though both orders indicated that Crystal and her lawyer had acted in agreement with these arrangements, both orders were signed by the co-counsel attorneys on the fraudulent behalf of Crystal's attorney. In that second order of April 3, 2012, the so-called judge, Brian Oakley, directed Crystal's counter-complaint to be escalated to the Wayne County Circuit Court. Oakley was refusing to address Crystal's concerns at all after doing his damage and making her pay $700 a month in extortion payments to the 34th District Court in the name of Fannie Mae, who Crystal had never dealt with ever before. Jumping ahead somewhat, I should let you know that over $15,000 later in making those monthly escrow payments to the 34th District Court, Crystal has recently come to find out that no such escrow account was ever set up by the 34th District Court. It looks like that court has been keeping her money or investing it into some type of court registry investment system, or CRIS account, that is undisclosed somewhere and profiting the court itself. Nevertheless, as we have shown in previous segments about Crystal Price's case of being a victim of such racketeering by the bank, the law firm, and the county government to steal her home, and corruption by the courts to aid and abet and cover up these high crimes and misdemeanors, Trot and Trot and the Dykema Law Firms immediately violated the 34th District Court order to remove the counter-complaint to the Wayne County 3rd Judicial Circuit Court. Instead, they went to the U.S. District Court, where Crystal's attorney, Henry Sandwies, as Crystal eventually found out, was not authorized to practice law. This was also where Crystal's attorney, Sandweed, literally attempted to extort $20,000 out of Crystal in effort to coerce her into taking a measly $4,000 offer from the criminals and call it quits. In the meantime, despite being unauthorized to practice law in the federal courts, Sandweed went ahead and executed the federal action of granting a federal court motion filed by the criminals to extend their time for having to file their answer to the cross-complaint that Crystal had already seen delayed because of the earlier order by the 34th District Court Judge Oakley to send her cross-complaint away from his court. It is clear that by this time, the attorney Sandwies had joined this criminal conspiracy of attorneys and judges, and that is when Crystal filed to have Sandwies taken off of her case so to go at it on her own. Even though they were granted an extension of time to file their answer in the federal court, the criminals were still negligent in not filing their answer. As told by Crystal, the reason why is because when Alexandra Wolf and Matthew Levine, the co-counsel attorneys for Freddie Mac, had seen that Crystal was not going to take their $4,000 offer to stay out of federal court and instead fired her attorney and took the case on herself, these co-counsel attorneys realized that their smokescreen of taking the case to federal court in violation of the lower court order instructing Crystal's cross-complaint to be instead taken to the county circuit court, they realized that their strategy to pressure, intimidate, and extort Crystal did not work. So they were busy scrambling to cover their tracks by filing bogus civil claims in the Wayne County Circuit Court. While they were doing that, Ms. Price filed her motion in the federal court asking the federal judges, Paul Comives and Mark Goldsmith, for a default judgment in her favor and against Freddie Mac because of Freddie Mac's failure to file their answer to Crystal's cross-complaint. Of course, those federal judges would not do it, and instead, they ended up ruling to dismiss Crystal's counter-complaint altogether, ignoring all of the claims and the overwhelming evidence of the fraud leading up to this point. and forcing Crystal, 
again, under color of law, to either give up or to exercise her right of due process at her own cost to appeal the federal decision at the Sixth Circuit Court level. Subsequently, as also shown, the Tribunal of Sixth Circuit Court judges, consisting of one former Chief Judge, Danny Boggs, and the current Chief Judge, Alice Batchelder, as two of the three judges on the Sixth Circuit Tribunal to review all this fraud, who altogether chose, along with the third judge, Eric Clay, to instead look the other way and shirk their obligation to do the right thing, again dismissing Crystal's Sixth Circuit Court appeal. This course of events thus took the period between mid-2012 to the beginning of 2014, leading to where Crystal Price found herself once again right where she started two years earlier in the judicial process before Judge Brian Oakley of the 34th District Court, confronting him with what he had done off the record in manufacturing fraudulent judicial records in which he had been having her pay $700 a month to that court for two years by order that the money was to be going to Fannie Mae when, in fact, no escrow account was ever open to Crystal's credit and confronting Judge Oakley with the resulting fraud that took place that previous two years with the criminal extortion by her attorney and cover-up by the federal judges of the fact that Oakley's directive to escalate the case to the circuit court had been disregarded when Freddie Mac, Trot and Trot, and the Dykema Law Firm took the matter to the federal level instead. As shown already in segment number four, Oakley displayed his own contempt for the judicial process by being sarcastic, threatening, belittling, and while whitewashing over his previous crimes against Crystal with amendments to his previous two-year escrow order. As a reminder, this hearing was yet actually the very first time that Crystal Price had been before a judge ever on this case in over two years of fighting these injustices by state and federal judges. This 34th District Court Judge Oakley executed the cover-up of his earlier crime by first reopening what he had wrongly thought had been a closed case, while simultaneously refusing, on the record, to consider anything that Crystal Price might wish to submit to the court on her own behalf. His doing so constituted yet another instance of fraud upon the people of Michigan, since he clearly was acting outside of his judicial capacity, swearing at Crystal from the bench, and making clear to her that he was treating her unlawfully with prejudicial bias, whether race-related or not. Ultimately, Oakley, like all of the federal judges, dismissed Crystal's efforts to have the three-year pending eviction case against her dismissed. In ruling for Trot and Trot and their client of Freddie Mac, Crystal was forced once again to sustain further injury by taking her appeal of Oakley's actions to the even more corrupt Wayne County Circuit Court. Ultimately, Oakley, like all the federal judges, dismissed Crystal's efforts to have the two-year pending eviction case against her dismissed. That leads us as the audience to the Wayne County Circuit Courtroom of Judge Daphne Means Curtis, where Crystal has been for the past few months and, in fact, has already been before unknowingly two years ago with one of three previous bogus cases that was filed on behalf of and in conjunction with Trot and Trot attorneys. In the next segment, we will show you more of the tag team of criminal activity that took place against Crystal when Dykema Gossett attorney Alexandra Wolf took the lead from Trot and Trot attorneys by simply dumping a single page at the Wayne County Circuit Court and filing instead in the federal court, where the Eastern District of Michigan Federal Court and the Sixth Circuit judges subsequently took Crystal on a two-year criminal ride using color of law, when they never had the jurisdiction in the first place to take any action whatsoever on Crystal Price's counterclaim. We'll show you how, when the Trot and Trot and the Dykema Gossett teams of attorneys realized that Crystal Price would be taking a stand by herself, in challenging that federal jurisdiction by accurately reporting the previous fraud perpetrated against her, against the multiple courts, and against the public up to then. These attorneys scrambled to file bogus cases back in the Wayne County Circuit Court 
an effort to cover their ass after violating the 34th District Court order in going straight to the federal court in the first place rather than to the Wayne County Circuit Court as written in the 34th District Court order. We'll show you that Judge Daphne Curtis, as well as the second Wayne County Circuit Court Judge Prentice Edwards, had reviewed evidence of these fraudulent cases back in 2012 and aided in the cover-up by quietly dismissing them without even so much as reporting these filings as suspicious. We'll show you how two years later, when issued the appeal of the case against Crystal that was ruled upon by 34th District Court Judge Brian Oakley in favor of Trot and Trot, that Judge Daphne Curtis once again had the opportunity to do the right thing in early 2014 in questioning the legitimacy of Trot and Dykema attorney actions, but for some reason did not. Additionally, we'll show you the reasons why not, while also revealing the number of ways in which Judge Daphne means Curtis, at the very time of this investigative report is being produced, is committing felony crimes of fraud, including but not limited to fraud upon the court, and the very same type of mortgage and bank fraud that sent former Michigan Supreme Court Judge Diane Hathaway to federal prison. Might we want to ask ourselves what Judge Daphne Curtis and her husband Paul Curtis were doing with the Trot and Trot law firm when getting foreclosed upon by JPMC Specialty Mortgage in 2013 and 2014, while going through the jurisdiction of the Circuit Court of Washtenaw County? When the mortgage records at the Register of Deeds and the property itself are both located in Wayne County? How about we ask ourselves what the longtime employed Wayne County Judge Daphne Curtis was doing being represented in court by a poverty lawyer from the Michigan Poverty Law Program? What other significant events took place in the life of Judge Daphne Curtis and her husband Paul Curtis? such as is reflected in this attorney discipline record showing the suspension of Paul Curtis's law license in June 2013. Are you interested? Stay tuned as we the people, we the Rico Busters, take down the house of cards surrounding the racketeering influenced and corrupt organizations that have long been operating in Wayne County and indeed throughout Michigan.